<clears throat> okay, um, hello. Uh, today we'll talk about two architects, Johann Balthasar Neumann and Dan Hanganu. Both of them born on, uh, on, on January uh, uh, 27th. So let's uh, read a little bit about um, uh, Balthasar Neumann. Uh, just a second, because um, technology is testing my uh, my my nerves. I, I cannot. Okay, I finally am able to move forward. So let's uh, let's read a little bit about it. Uh, Johann Balthasar Neumann, as you can see, born on January twenty seventh, known as Balthasar Neumann, was a German architect and military artillery engineer who developed a refined brand of Baroque architecture, fusing Austrian, Bohemian, Italian, and French elements to design some of the most impressive buildings of the period, including the Fürzburg residence and the Basilica of the 14 Holy Helpers. The Würzburg uh, residence is considered one of the most beautiful and well-proportioned palaces in Europe. And the Basilica of the 14 Holy Helpers is considered by some as the crowning work of the period. And this was the man. Hello, Mr. Neumann. <laughs> I mean, uh, at that time, probably everybody looked like Johann Sebastian Bach because of the wig. You know, the wig uh, does something to a person, no doubt. I wonder why shouldn't architects today also wear wigs? I mean, I don't know if you noticed and I don't know if you if you like watching uh, soccer games, meaning football games, but the football players are obsessed about their coiffure and they change it all the time in some very exotical ways. Um, I wonder why, anyway. <clears throat> so this was the man, this was the architect, Baldazar Neumann. And of course, his hand uh, is uh, pointing towards some kind of uh, crowning architectural achievement, probably his own. <clears throat> and yes, he was an architect. There is no uh, you know, uh, doubt about it if we contemplate the picture. Now, why does it have that uh, special attire? You know, it seems to be metallic somehow. I don't know. But uh, there is metal and there is also velvet. And uh, so, you know, he was a military architect as well, but also a man who loved velvet, meaning an artist. He made it even to a banknote, to a, to a you know, a, a currency, to a, you know, uh, this is what it was. It was a um, banknote, yeah. I think there is this English word, I'm not sure. Anyway, in all the rage, Balthazar Neumann. Uh, let's see what he built here in Hessen, a church. Well, you know, a uh, Baroque building um, still stands. <clears throat> I wonder how many of our buildings still will still stand after three centuries or so. More than three centuries. I don't think too many. But uh, they built differently than Capel Kreuzberg. Although I have to tell you, no, I had seen the skyscrapers in New York uh, built 100 years ago, and they are impeccable. I mean, with all skepticism about um, contemporary or modern uh, ways of building, um, I, I think uh, we are still capable of making buildings that last for a long time. A, cap a chapel. Balthazar Neumann, and it would be interesting actually to compare Balthazar Neumann with uh, Dan Hangano. <clears throat> you know, a Baroque uh, architect, a German architect, and a Romanian modern architect who assumed himself the program of a church uh, in different ways. I know of three projects by him uh, related to a church design. One remained a church, the other two were transformed into a theater and, uh, and a library. I like Baroque art and Baroque architecture, you know, and actually the Baroque is, is having uh, some kind of a revival now. 
thanks to parametry, parametric design, uh, thanks to Maya, uh, thanks to all kinds of uh, technologies, we are able to handle fluidities. And uh, I would say some of the works that are the most, uh, um, you know, uh, engaging now are, uh, in, are done in a Baroque spirit, a contemporary Baroque spirit. But the Baroque uh, could be at odds with the with the need for sustainability, you know, with uh, with limited means, uh, increasingly, you know, limited means, and with the climate change and so on. But maybe we can negotiate somehow, you know. At least in some buildings, we could uh, express our exuberance through a Baroque mode, so to speak but uh, contemporary Baroque, not in this way. At that time, of course, uh, the builder collaborated with painters and sculptors, and it was, um, you know, a whole uh, uh, work that involved all the arts. As you can see, he built a lot. I mean, you know, like uh, secular uh, buildings, uh, palaces and so on, and then lots of churches, small and big, so Neumann was a force, uh, no doubt, in the field of architecture. Uh, we, we won't see, you know, here, you know, social housing or uh, things like this. But at that time, it was a different world, not necessarily a better one. Uh, what is this? A palace. Um, I don't have for all of them the adequate pictures, but we move forward. I apologize. What is this? Another residence. Uh, can you believe it? Let me read again, because I almost don't believe it. Uh, in Feisburg, Germany, 1719-1744. So it lasted for 25 years. But look what they built. <laughs> my God, my God. I actually like it. I wouldn't mind, you know, having such a living room or whatever. It might be. Uh, I wouldn't complain that it has too much art. No. Now I would even like the chandeliers. You know, uh, usually I dislike them. But here they seem to be at home. An incredible room, isn't it? It could make one sick of art, but uh, I wouldn't be that someone. I like it. Well, it was built during 25 years, and you can imagine, you know, how many artists and sculptors and so on worked on, on, on this. I, if the devil in me would be pressing me, I would say to the students in Bucharest, why don't you make architectural projects like this, you know, for a change? Just... Uh, just start with the ornament, you know, with a room, and then you develop the hotel with five stars around it for a change. Now, this is a church. This is the palace. Uh, I have it here a little bit um, confusing. Uh, sorry, what is this? Another, another, I don't know what, uh, it's a church. I don't know German, and uh, I'm the first one to regret. Um, they are not bad, these Baroque churches. And there is some Baroque even uh, in, in Sibiu, my hometown, which has a mixture between the Baroque and the Gothic, and not an exacerbated, ex well, but the Baroque is um, an exacerbated uh, style, but uh, you can be, you know, moderately Baroque, so to speak. Although, although Oscar Wilde, uh, said that uh, moderation is a fatal thing. What succeeds always is excess. And Baroque is the, is the art of excess. Uh, by the way, of the Baroque, I organized a little exhibition in Vienna in 2017 called Angst Baroque with um, diploma works of seven uh, graduates from the postgraduate um, program at the Institute of Architecture. It was interesting. Um, 
I did it exactly on the day, I, I, I forgot, the day when, when Borromini was born or when Borromini died, the great Roman Baroque architect, mathematician, artist, and monk. Uh, this is Neumann. Not bad. Uh, they had different preoccupations. We we are concerned with parking lots. They, yeah, I, I wonder what 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 such an architect would, would have done in our time. He probably would have done parking lots, but not in this way. That's for sure. I mean, how could you make a baroque parking lot? <laughs> Maybe it's possible. Think about it. for Baroque cars and for people who wear wigs and velvet, lots of velvet, red if possible. Look at that ceiling. I mean, <laughs> yes, that's, that's, that's what happened when architecture was considered still an art the queen of the arts. And now we arrive at this famous uh, residence or palace, Würzburg, Würzburg residence. Uh, w in German, I know this is, is pronounced V and the V is pronounced F. Um, and, uh, let's, let's see it all of it um, in a picture because I started with the fragments because it's so big. I mean, look at it, look at this. It's actually not so flamboyant towards the outside, but it is, it is impressive. You know, it's, it's a real building of large, large dimensions. And uh, that's why I, I, I fragmented it. And I like this zooming capacity of, of the new technology because you can study details and discover things. You know, you can even make a, assessments on the on the on the curtains at the windows. Würzburg residence, but do you understand? This residence was not for proletarians. Was for some kind of prince or duke or king, a god, in other words. Yes, Würzburg, Würzburg residence. I made it myself because I actually had the chance to learn German. My parents even hired a private tutor you know, in German, and but I didn't like the language at all. And, and in the building I, I, I grew up in Sibiu, out of 13 families, six or seven, half of them were Germans, actually. So, you know, it would have been a, so easy for me to learn German, but I didn't. Now I regret, of course. A West Passat cluster, whatever, it's another church. It just did the, the western facade, which is this one with the entrance in the church, Balthazar Neumann. Hello, Mr. Neumann. Uh, apparently, there is a prize, a prize called the Balthazar Neumann Prize. Um, so, and here he is on the on a stamp. Yes, he was born in 1687 on the 27th of January. And uh, the palace, we just looked at the so-called residence, Würzburg residence, we, we just looked at it and it's on the, on, the, on the stamp. And he made it also, as I said, on, on the money here, but I don't see his, uh, his uh, name here. Maybe it's the other side, yes. <laughs> Now, now, dear students and young architects, please do make something so you'll make it to a, a banknota, you know, make it to a, to a money, you know, your portrait. Why should we have only poets and a sculptor, famous as he was? Why not an architect? Maybe Dan Hanganu came close to deserving it. The Basilica of the 14 Holy Helpers, 
um, let's let's look first at the plan. Sorry about uh, this successive fragmentation. So we see the ellipse now uh, three times, and then we see the two circles there. Almost a typical Baroque uh, church plan. And uh, we see, I don't know if he made these, maybe they were done later. Is this one? No, yeah, is it the same one? I think, yeah, it's the same building, the 14 helpers. Sorry. Sometimes I like, but this, this time I don't. Um, the Basilica Firts, and yes, the, the 14 holy helpers. Uh, those who, who know the Bible well probably understand what that means. I, I don't, because I'm a terrible reader of the, of, the, of the Bible. So here it is. 18th century. Uh, an opulent uh, church, indeed. Of course, he didn't work here alone. Now, there were artists, a team of artists. They were concerned mainly with beauty, you know, they didn't have, they would not have understand uh, our concerns with the functionalism. Uh, even the word probably would have been totally strange to them. What do you mean functionalism? All doors, two meters and 10 centimeters tall, all of them. I mean, why? Why should we make all the doors the same height? And I just mentioned one standardization. There are many. The problem is if you if you if you for a number of years you keep doing the projects where all the doors are two meters and ten centimeters, you you end up doing always doors two meters and ten centimeters doors because it's uh, it becomes um, second nature. I think it was Pascal, bless Pascal, who was four hundred years since he was born. I mean, this happens this year. Bless Pascal, who said something like this, um, nature is the first habit, and happy habit is the second nature. Yeah. Interesting, interesting thought. Here he is, we saw him. And that's it. Let's wish him happy birthday. And now we go to, to Dan Hangano, our countryman who, with good reasons perhaps, decided to begin his adventure outside of the country. And he arrived in Canada. Uh, later in his life, uh, he regretted that he went to Canada. And Kenneth Frampton told me that actually he, he would have liked to go to New York. But also, Frampton thought, and I would agree with him, he had more, more success in Canada than he would have had in New York City. And he, he, he did have plenty of, of, of success in Canada. So, let's see. He was born in 1939 on the 27th of January and died uh, six years ago. Uh, there is such a website, canadianarchitecture.com, features an incorrigible optimist. Uh, it is dedicated to uh, Dan Hanganu. So Dan Sergio Hanganu, born, as you can see, on uh, January 27th, 1939, and died on October 5th, 2017, was a Romanian-born Canadian architect based in Montreal, Quebec. He designed a number of prominent Quebec buildings, including the new wing of the Pointe-Calier Museum, 
the the HEC Montreal building, the concert hall of Rimouski, the UQAM design school and several other mixed use commercial, residential and cultural buildings in Montreal, Europe and Asia. Well, I didn't see these buildings in Asia, nor in Europe, but let's continue. Hanganu was the recipient of an impressive list of awards and publications, including the Order of Canada, the Governor General's Award, and was also awarded the RAIC Gold Medal in 2008 for lifetime achievement. These are not uh, small achievements at all. They are actually huge. And we should be proud that uh, a Romanian arrived at that level of, um, of excellence. He died on October 5th in 2017 in Montreal, Quebec. And he wrote something that, that, that Alvarado wrote and said, the discourse of architecture as a cultural phenomenon. And Alvarado said architecture belongs to culture, not to civilization. But here is the Romanian Dan Hanganu saying the discourse about architecture as a cultural phenomenon. And I wonder if we do this sufficiently. Un monument québécois, that's how the newspaper, a newspaper from Montreal uh, uh, describe him when he died. Uh, um, a monument from Quebec, and uh, and uh, I read in another article that um, the whole city of Montreal was mourning, you know, uh, when he died. Un monument québécois, littéralement, c'est atteint le jeudi uh, 5 octobre. L'architecte Dan Hanganu, impressionnant par sa stature et par son œuvre, est décédé, est décédé à l'hôpital où il se trouvait depuis quelques semaines. Il avait uh, 78 ans. So, a monument uh, from Quebec, uh, literally, uh, he, uh, he uh, a mourit uh, joy 5 octobre, architectul Dan Hanganu, Impressionant prin statura sa și prin opera sa, a murit la spital unde se găsea de câteva săptămâni. Avea 78 de ani. Îmi place enorm această fotografie și sunt emoționat acum pentru că am cunoscut și eu emigrarea, emigrația. Știu ce înseamnă să fie emigrant. Dar asta e o poză făcută probabil când el încă era în România. Și arăta foarte bine și îmi place enorm și paltonul lui. Păi, acum vorbesc în românește, I should talk in English. Um, this is a picture of Dan Hanganu before he left Romania. And uh, I was on the point of saying that I like very much his winter coat. Um, I found one in a second-hand uh, store uh, very similar to this one. I, I immediately bought it for um, the great investment of one, the equivalent of one dollar. Unfortunately, the, the malls ate it. A beautiful, beautiful winter coat. But he looks great here. And um, what can we say? There are, there are romantic souls uh, that are born on this land, and some of them, unfortunately, live. Here he is in Montreal, in his office. And uh, I like this picture too, you know, he, it is, uh, uh, there is the, the same, uh, the same, uh, the same man, you know, who has a um, vessel, the vase, and I don't know what's in that other bottle, and some objects on, uh, and, and the window, and the so-called imperfections of the, of the back wall, you know, stone as it is, and uh, you know, not quite careful painted uh, arch with white, as you can see. It's okay, it's fine. Now, Puanta Calier Museum, 1990-1992, this is a very important work by him. It's actually the museum of the beginnings and the archaeology, archaeology of the beginnings of the city of Montreal. It's a work a little bit, a little bit touched by uh, postmodernism, but uh, it's it's an excellent work. This was the situation 
before he built in this place his building, uh, probably done, uh, who knows, 100 years ago or so, this picture. And this is what he built. And we are going to see in detail the work. I mean, a great uh, honor to, I don't know how he obtained this um, commission, uh, maybe through a competition or uh, I, I don't know, but uh, a very important building in a very important city. We are talking about Montreal and our countryman Dan Hanganu did a, a, a very good job here. Uh, this is the model of the building. Now, of course, the functionalist, the strict functionalist will, would protest because he put his canopy here quite far away from the level of the, you know, the entrance into the building. So it doesn't really protect you. But it's whimsical and it, 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 it looks good. Although, as I said, uh, the functionalist would, uh, would, uh, would complain. And there are here, you know, uh, stones, rocks having to do, because again, it's about the, you know, in a way, the point zero of the history of, of Montreal. It's, it's the museum dedicated to the, you know, to the beginnings of the city. Um, sketches, preliminary sketches. At uh, that time, he probably worked without uh, the help of uh, technology, meaning, you know, with a T-square and the rectangle and so on. Panta Galier. I regret now I have this, um, I alternate pictures with plans. It's a little bit confusing, um, but. Now, I don't know, I mean, I look at these, I don't know what they are. Maybe I, they are just some kind of an uh, ornament here. Maybe they have some, I don't know, uh, abstruse function. But they don't seem to be quite vertical, you know, they are a little bit uh, inclined uh, to, uh, towards the right. I wonder if he intended them like this. Um, but this is uh, just a detail, so to speak. We saw this one, uh, we see again the plans, a museum. Uh, sorry, uh, this shouldn't be here. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know what, what's going on here. I, I, sh I, I probably have another presentation and I picked up the wrong one. This is another project by him, which is not the museum. Uh, it's, uh, it's some housing. Pro uh, maybe I wanted to show that at that time, uh, in the early 90s, he was still affected by postmodernism, although deconstructivism started to manifest itself around that time. But here we see some influences, Mario Botta and others. Um, not the, in my opinion, not the greatest works, this. Uh, gallery, Dorchester Gallery, a 1987, an earlier, uh, an earlier project. Um, this is a drawing by him with a flamboyant sun. I don't think, I mean, with all due respect and affection, I don't think, uh, the architectural drawings of Duncan Ganur are extremely, you know, they, they, they are, you know, an architect's drawing with 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 the uh, with the uh, markers. But you know, they, this kind of drawing is, uh, yeah, it's very common. You know, he didn't draw like uh, Carlos Scarpa, that's for sure, or uh, other, you know, famous architects. Maybe this was a good tool. Uh, I find the drawing a little bit commercial for my taste, but it worked for him. Falati's Hotel, 2005, another drawing uh, by him. Um, 
I think his architecture is much better than his drawings. Espace 400 Pavilion, 2006-2008. Um, no, no, I, I have to do another another PowerPoint presentation with his work because it's not it's not chronological enough. And uh, but let's see what we can do now with what we have here. So this is what is is a I don't know. It's some kind of a gallery or art space or it's a good building though. Is this one you know and. Uh, I, I like the fact that he's uh, 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 employing uh, also uh, uh, ornamentation in a way. The facade is animated by uh, things that are not uh, structural. You know, I, I, I mean, that glass, you know, most people would have left the glass by itself. But I see, and I think this was his uh, work, his proposal, and was not just uh, the way the, the clients or the owners of the building um, proposed, but I think it was because I see them here too. In my opinion, uh, there is a problem though with this architecture, although I like the building, but was it really uh, truly at home in such a cold climate like Quebec, Canada, with so much glass? I mean, you understand this building in order to, to function needed uh, a lot of uh, air condition. So I think someone more, uh, more uh, uh, concerned with the climate and with the temperatures would not have used so much glass. That's what I am tempted to think, but that's what he did. It is a good building, but um, the, the demagogy of glass turns me off a little bit, and I explained why. Because you don't expect in such a cold climate, as certainly is there, to have, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, almost, you know, Mediterranean look or... Uh... But, you know, the obsession with glass belongs to everybody. And so belong to him. But you see the treatment of the of the glass here uh, also. And I like this fact very much that he covered the glass in some portions, at least, with um, you know, something of an artistic nature, so to speak. And you see it here as well. But but again, for my taste, it's too much glass for Montreal, for Quebec. But this is the, you know, this was the time, um, you know, and at that time, at least, uh, there wasn't so much, uh, you know, concern with the climate change because there was no climate change in the 1990s. But still, if you, if you take in, into consideration the winter, what the winter means, you no, know, the snow, the freezing temperatures, how could you use so much glass? Well, you can because Canada, Canada has money and, uh, you know, pumping air conditioning to warm up. Otherwise, you would freeze in, 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 in such a building with so much glass. This is um, a whimsical chair. He, he designed several. Um, you see the, the, the wing, I feel like saying, of postmodernism, touching his uh, sensitivity, but they are very theatrical and almost surrealist. You'll see others, and this shows uh, another side of Dan Hanganu, less concerned with uh, maybe with commerce or with functionalism to an extent, and more with, uh, with uh, the oniric um, aspects of uh, stage design. Look at this chair. Now, who would say that this chair is a comfortable chair? In no way it is comfortable. It's more like, a, you know, a, an installation, half, you know, half sculpture, half something else. Um, but it's skillfully done and whimsically in a way. I like it, but I, but I would prefer to, to sit on a, on a different chair than this one. It's a theatrical uh, chair. Oh, 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 look, this is another design for a lamp. Uh, it's not bad. 
because uh, at least in this case, you are not going to sit on the land. This is another chair. This one whimsical as well, I would say. So this shows another side of, of, of Dan Hangan, the, the playfulness of Dan Hangan. Or look at this one, you know? I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, theater, you know? It's that uh, fur, you know, uh, that uh, invites you more than the structure around it. Or this one, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's really, uh, you know, a surrealist object. Now you could probably sit on it, but Dan Hangan. But then Romania had great surrealists, so I'm glad that uh, an architect assumed surrealism and, uh, you know, uh, built something uh, from a position of, uh, of a surrealist mood. Uh, he designed also, uh, you know, uh, like other architects um, of success, um, you know, forks and spoons and so on. Personally, I'm a little bit turned off by the folkish aesthetic. You know, it's, I mean, transformed through the material into some kind of a modernity, but uh, you can you can tell that uh, Motivul uh, Furca is kind of present. Uh, not here, though. In lamps, he was a little bit more uh, modern. And uh, it's interesting because it also shows his ability to assume the so-called disorder of a cable that is not uh, hidden in a tube or whatever. And I, I like this fact that, uh, you know, he, he enjoyed also showing uh, the things that were not planned. Now, this is a law library in, uh, in Montreal. McGill, this is a very important uh, university. Uh, I don't know if I pronounce well its name, McGill, McGill. McGill somehow sounds better, a law library. Um, so he designed some, some very important buildings uh, there. I like more the side, the side elevation, this one, than the front elevation, and I will try to explain why. I think, I think the idea to, to have the equilateral triangle, meaning justice, is a good one. But what bothers me is the presence of these two fragmented columns, left and right. You know, so the purity of the concept, so to speak, is a little bit affected, in my opinion, with this. I wonder if he could not have avoided them, but uh, maybe I, I think too much in absolute terms. Um, otherwise, it's, 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 it's approximately a good building. Uh, but we see here, this is the library, and we see the big word here, which I like, reve, which means to dream, to dream, reve. Um, I think we need that. We need to dream ourselves. But uh, this interior is uh, also present uh, almost identically in a, in a church that he transformed into a library. Is this one, or maybe I'm a little bit confused, or maybe I wanted to show the two libraries, yeah, I have to, I have to do another presentation. Sorry about this. So this is the law library at McGill University, and then this is, uh, this is not the law library, but is this library that he, um, uh, you know, transformed this church into? It was an existing church. He trans she, he transformed it into a, into a library. Uh, I like the shaping, the, the volumes, but what I, again, I have troubles with is this, uh, you know, exuberant use of glass, 
I mean, exuberant, not in terms of form, because it's very, you know, Cartesian, but so much glass. And look, there is no here. It's obviously very cold. I, I don't think it's right, but that's my opinion. But I like uh, very much the, you know, the, the silhouette of the building, uh, which was derived perhaps from the, you know, the, the existing, uh, I don't know, the existing church uh, vanished. From what I remember, there was an existing church, but I don't see its uh, traces any longer. Um, maybe I remember wrongly. Although the silhouette of the building uh, does suggest the presence of a church. I mean, you know, if you see this section, you wouldn't say this is a library. You would say this is a church. But now it is a, it is a library. This, this part of the building bothers me because it's, it's out of place in, in, in such a cold climate. And plus, what does this have to do with this? That there, there are two different architectural languages, both valid, but together they seem to be conflictual. Otherwise the building is, um, is uh, convincing. I wish I had more pictures of, of, of this. I, I really have to, to make another PowerPoint presentation for next year or for uh, the 5th of October when we'll pay homage to him because he died on the 5th of October, six years ago. Okay, now, Florent uh, Orstadt Church. Actually, he built the more churches. This is another, this one, um, I mean, it has this uh, bell tower, if we are to call it so. Otherwise, this building could have been anything. I don't wonder how it is inside. I wish I had other pictures. But it has dignity and, you know, clarity of conception and uh, assumed modernity and so on. Now, this work I like very much. Théâtre du Nouveau Monde, the theater of the new world. Uh, I like it very much because it, it is uh, not what you would expect from a theater. Usually theaters are, you know, stand out um, through the, you know, unique design. But this one is modest. And I like this very much. Uh, and I see here some influence coming from um, Scandinavian design. I'm thinking maybe of uh, Ralph Erskine. Um, I think he did a great job here, exactly because he didn't try to, you know, make an emphatic uh, building. And it's just, uh, you know, uh, something part of the urban fabric uh, without, uh, without too much uh, noise, so to speak, but with the distinct at the level of architecture in its modesty. I'm not sure about these two columns here, which appear also, you remember, in the, in the, in the law library at McGill University, but the building behind this, um, is, is, I, I, it, 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 uh, it receives from me uh, a total approval. Not that it mattered to him at all, or it, it matters. I'm just saying that I like the building. And here, he also worked with existing conditions, because this part of the wall and probably this, this, this part of the building, at least, or maybe a large part of the building belonged to an existing structure. And he just introduced some new elements. And I, 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 I like, and I like the fact, you know, the, the modesty the, of, of, of this, these um, pavilions, you know, just, uh, um, you know, moving towards the sidewalk in a very, you know, friendly and serving way. 
it's an organism for, uh, you know, maybe experimental theater. It's nothing. It's not. It's not a building that, that crashes you know, and, and screams at you, I'm a theater, I'm the theater, no. So I, I like this aspect of, of, of having the ability to connect with the city, with the sidewalk, with the people in um, you know, through small architectural gestures. He liked probably the theater. Uh, there is another one. We are going to see a church that he transformed into a theater. And I remember once I was in the office of the president of the university here in Bucharest when he entered his, his office. Uh, he just came from Canada. And he said, he said something, a very unusual story about, I don't know, the airport. I don't remember being... Uh, uh, a lot, but I do remember him saying that two police people, two policemen, but one was a lady. Uh, I forgot exactly what they came to him or they came to someone else, but he described her, the policewoman, as being so short that, that she wouldn't be taller than where the knees of her colleague, the policeman, were. And I, of course, this, this, this cannot happen. It, it was a an exaggeration, but uh, it shows his appetite. It showed his appetite for theater. Okay, and now this is another work. I, I, I don't know what's going on here. I, 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 I'm I very disappointed of myself. I, I should have had a, I expected another, I probably have another presentation. Although the way I, 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 I label these presentations, this would have, should have been the, the most uh, developed. But I'm not sure. This is another work he did he, as a design consultant or uh, uh, I forgot. I, I'll probably come back. I hope I come back to this building, although it's not was criticized this building, but it's a huge building uh, that he built. In the meantime, let's take a look at Siege Social, Cirque du Soleil. Du Soleil. Uh, Cirque du Soleil is a famous uh, uh, circus and the social you know, headquarters of this uh, institution. Uh, here he is receiving a prize together with two artists. And I read that he was very uh, happy to be acknowledged as an artist, being an architect, he thought that uh, you know it is an honor to 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 see the work of an architect worthy of being considered artistically artistically valuable. Le devoir, libre de penser. Devoir means uh, task, and libre libre de penser, freedom to think. Montreal on deuil de l'architecte Dan Hanganu. Montreal is mourning the architect Dan Hanganu. Uh, H E C Montreal. Ah, this is the building that uh, we saw a picture of um, previously, and uh, I apologize, it should have been here. He did the, the design for this building. Uh, I read some criticism about it. Uh, it's a huge building. It's. Um, you know, uh, I don't know exactly its function, uh, unfortunately, but uh, could be almost anything, a university or... Now, I don't, this, was the, this was the rendering of the building, and but it was not built as, as the rendering shows, unless, unless there, there were changes, you know, or temporary, uh, you know, uh, arrangements, uh, that is possible too. Um, I don't think it's one of his greatest achievements, this building, maybe because I'm influenced probably also by the criticism that I read. 
So uh, the pre-Paul Mile Bull Bulldoz is an awards program that recognizes the contributions of artists. From what I understand, I was that's what he declared. I was the only practicing architect to receive this award. The prize acknowledged the idea that an architect can be an artist. Um, I almost feel tempted to say the prize should acknowledge the idea that an architect should be an artist. I mean, an artist as well. Bank Street Building, um, 2003. Uh, this is a project that was not realized. This was his proposal. And I think he did a good job here between these two, you know, all the buildings and uh, too bad it was not built. I hope I have a, I should have, yeah, I have this rendering. So he proposed this building connecting in a way with the context and yet asserting their time and place and their modernity. I think he did a good job here, but was not built. A very large building. Bank Street building. I don't know their function. Well, maybe office towers or maybe even the housing, apartment buildings, I don't know. But I think something institutional. Too bad was not built. Benedictine Monastery uh, in Saint Benoit du Lac in Quebec. Here he he just did some um, you know changes, interventions inside a, an existing um, monastery and church. 1994, but an extensive uh, intervention. Here I see again uh, touches of a. Uh, predictable uh, postmodernism, a little bit of late postmodernism, but there are there are there are qualities here. Stained glass. That's nice. So I, I like the fact that, you know, he he worked with an existing building, but he, uh, you know, attempted to show the time he was uh, living in and working in. And so, you know, it didn't just uh, try to mimic what the old building suggested. No. And I think that's the correct way to, to, to you know, to, to work for a certain time and place and not betray it. That's why on the secessionist building in Vienna of Maria Olbrich, there is this uh, call to arms, if I am to call it so, about the freedom of the creators, of the artists, and including the architects. To each age, it's art, and to art, it's freedom. Again, to each age, it's art, and to art, it's freedom. Impressive mountain there. So a monastery in Quebec. A rendering by uh, uh, Dan Hanganu, the long se longitudinal section, a cross section. The detail.
I see some diagonals here, and you know, I'm I'm trying to organize that festival dedicated to the diagonal. Otherwise, in the exterior, not too many diagonals, but that's okay. A splendid landscape. Happy nuns. Museum of Archaeology and History. This one we already saw. Uh, I guess at the beginning was just some disordered, uh, uh, you know, uh, not quite chronological presentation. Now I come back to uh, this work that you saw. Um, the, but across the street here on the right is another building done by him, which I like very much. Uh, I hope I show it in, in this presentation. We saw this already, sorry. I'm surprised I did this PowerPoint. I'm talking about this building. Uh, but still here, if I see it from far away, Closer to it, you don't see the glass box at the top. And it's much better. I, I, these glass boxes um, turn me off. I, I, I think here, you know, the fact that the wall, it's the opaque wall, the solid wall is predominant. I think that's, that's an adequate architecture for a climate like in, uh, in Montreal. But since Canada has money, pumping, uh, air conditioning uh, to make the space livable uh, is probably not a problem. La Maison de Marin, Montréal, is this building across the street from the Museum of Arche the Archaeology of M Montreal. And I like it very much here. He also was dealing with an existing building and he made modifications and some interventions. And I think he did a good job. You know, and also look at this, you know, this this shows sophistication. You know, is this, uh, again, the power of the diagonal, the betrayal of the diagonal. This was not really needed, you know, functionally. I mean, he could have left the building without this piece here at the top. But I think this, uh, you know, like, uh, how do you say in Romanian? Cozorocului nui kipiu sau. You know, it, it, it gives a distinctive uh, look. And uh, I think it works. Again, I'm not so sure about these large, large surfaces of glass, but at least there are also walls and the vertical windows of much smaller dimensions, which I think is much more appropriate for, for a city like Montreal. But it has, a, in a way, it's a hybrid building. It has um, narrow, tall windows, rather small, and then he has, uh, you know, uh, uh, suprafece vitrate, large uh, curtain walls. And uh, so there are various things happening here, which I think it's, 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 it's okay and pleasant. I don't know what this section is. I mean, plan. I, as I said, I, I like the fact that he has two types of windows, a curtain wall and also the so-called, uh, you know, less modern, you know, the vertical narrow windows. So it's, a, it's hybrid aesthetically, but I think it works. That, that is how the building looked like before his intervention. And I think he did a good job at uh, continuing what the, the old building suggested and also uh, assume a certain level of invention or betrayal. So you have tradition and innovation. You have continuity and a break, both. And I think this shows uh, complexity and subtlety. And, and uh, I think it is the correct way to uh, to work in such a in such a situation. Obviously, uh, Montreal loved him since the city was mourning when he died. 
I mean, I wonder if the city of Bucharest will ever uh, or will 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 would would mourn any architect, uh, you know, who unfortunately might one day uh, pass away. I I, I doubt it. Uh, this theater also I I I, I like. Uh, it's a it's a church that was well. We can talk about the idea to transform a church into a theater, but uh, I think he did a good job. So it's an existing church, which was transformed into a small theater, and he added these uh, parts here that didn't exist before. Um, of course, we could uh, also talk about the sensuousness of the red red uh, uh, thing hanging from the ceiling there, which is... Uh, you know, if you think about the former church, you would say, well, you could say actually that is the blood of the, you know, of, of, of the sacrifice of God's son. Uh, but, but I hear is about the is about is about not not Christ or the church is about the theater, I think. Anyway. Um, Yeah, the, this happens often in the in the corrupt. I'm in between quotation marks and decadent between quotation marks. Uh, I, I I employ a sarcasm against myself now of the West, you know, transforming churches into secular uh, buildings. I like this thing here, you know, whatever it is. I think it's, it's uh, again, shows his appetite for theater. Well, the church. Cirque du Soleil headquarters in Montreal, another big work and uh, big, uh, <laughs> big it is. Initially, I didn't like this facade, but later looking at it twice or three times and so on, I began to see certain, you know, sophistications here. It's a blank wall, but uh, uh, subtly differentiated in various zones by, you know, different colors and maybe these circles here played the uh, I mean, uh, playfully displayed, uh, refers in a way to the world of, of circus and uh, maybe even to the circus, Cirque du, du Soleil. Yeah, and now the School of Design, University of Quebec at Montreal, 1995, a sketch on uh, yellow tracing paper. Who uses yellow tracing paper these days? Not too many people. A big building. Um, Uh, I was uh, just uh, wondering what are these things here at the top. But we, we know by now that uh, Dan Hangan we employed, uh, you know, sometimes um, whimsical or, you know, playful elements, which are not necessarily dictated by function. I mean, even here in the plan, you know, the these things are, you know, deformations that have to do, I think, with emphasizing the public spaces, you know, like the entrance and so on, which need to be emphasized in a certain way. So, you know, here aesthetics are at home and uh, a certain level of capriciousness it's almost unavoidable.
here again we see the duality between small windows and uh, you know large um, you know glass surfaces curtain walls and so on so it looks like but i like the fact that he didn't use just one system but two Yeah, there are some echoes from uh, maybe Hiroshi Hara in Japan and, and others. It happens that I found a, at a second-hand bookstore in, uh, in Bucharest, an Antikariat, I found three uh, Japan architect magazines that belonged to uh, Dan Hanganu because they had a, a stamp or yeah, his name on, 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 on a page, or all of them. So I don't know how they arrived at uh, the second-hand bookstore. Maybe he offered them as a present to someone in Bucharest, and that someone later on sold them for nothing to a second-hand bookstore, because it is known that second-hand bookstores pay nothing for the books that they buy. I mean, they were very inexpensive. As I bought them, I like 10 lei for um, an issue of, of the Japan architecture. Uh, headquarters of Permacon, 2005-2007. What is this? Another institutional building of uh, smaller dimensions. I remember writing to Kenneth Frampton, I discovered a detail almost identical in the work of Enric Miraes in Barcelona. And I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, really, and I have it. I, I mean, it's almost identical. Now, I don't know, maybe it was just a coincidence, but it's hard to believe this because it, it's so peculiar. You know, why did he extend this uh, metal piece like this and with a slanted wall? And exactly the same situation appears in the work of Eric Miraes. Now, I don't know, you know, did Eric Miraes copy uh, Dan Hanganu or Dan Hanganu copied uh, Eric Miraes, or could it be that they did the same thing without knowing of each other? I'm just asking some questions. But considering the time when this was done, this was done after Eric Miraes died. So Eric Miraes couldn't copy this. And it is a peculiar thing, really. It's, I actually like it, but um, it doesn't have a, you know, necessarily a, a logical explanation. Another pavilion, which I like, 2013, is one of these, uh, you know, slanted works like deviant uh, architecture. It's a little pavilion, but uh, I like it. I, 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 it's, it's structurally sound, but it's also, um, you know, sculptural and uh, unexpected. I showed it to a friend of mine in Austria, an architect, and he said, ah, this was done probably by a young man in his office. This is not by Dan Hangano. I don't believe this. I mean, he's, he signed the work in his office. Anyway, uh, an interesting, uh, awkward little pavilion. And I like the, the details here. Here I actually see echoes of uh, Giovanni Michelucci in a, in a brilliant bank that uh, Giovanni Michelucci um, uh, built in Italy. I forgot in what city. Also using um, uh, metal painted in red or still painted in red, but here we also see something else, not just redness. I don't know, was it Einstein who said that uh, the genius is the one who uh, copies things that nobody knows where they were copied from or does it in such a, you know, uh, clever way that that it's impossible to know that it was actually, you know, a borrowed idea or so. I don't know. I think Einstein, but 
who knows? On the web, you find all kinds of uh, statements which are claimed to be belong to someone, and they might not be. So they might be just fake news. It's possible. Elgar Community Center, 2002. I like these more modest uh, works. Here I see influences again coming from Scandinavia, and I think appropriately so because Canada is also a country in the cold in a cold climate. So uh, I, I, I think uh, an influence coming from Scandinavia is uh, is a good thing. La Capital Head Office, 2012. So we remember he died in 2017. Uh, this is a work with a lot of, uh, uh, you know, architectural activity, so to speak, at the top. Uh, big building, uh, very big building. And um, the coiffure of the building is 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 what makes the building distinctive some uh, you know studies on uh, yellow tracing paper here it is a lot of glass again at, at the top even more than at the bottom or at the middle section of the building but what do what do these uh, pointed uh, you know, uh, volumes uh, say. I think they they talk about uh, you know the the exaltation of the building as it approaches the sky, so to speak. And you know, in the past, this was done with the sloping roofs, with ceramic tiles. Well, now we don't use sloping roofs. We have uh, flat roofs, but a certain uh, maybe nostalgia for exalting the top of the building still exists. I, I continue to think that it's too much glass for, uh, for uh, Quebec, but otherwise, you know, metal, glass, grayness, An office building, a large, large dimensions. A beautiful lawn, though, and the trees. But they were not done by Dan Hanganu. And also at the top, where there is a terrace, you see the, you know, the 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 presence of of, of nature. Uh, I would say in a in a in a inspired way, so not a very domesticated and. I think this is a good thing. I don't know, maybe these things are for, um, I don't know, summer uh, gatherings and talks. It's possible. They, they, they probably have some function. Otherwise, considering their dimensions and, and the, the expenditures in order to build them, it would be hard for me to believe they had no function at all. Now, Marc Favreau Library in Montreal. Uh, this is an intriguing building because it has two, two sides. It's an L building, but made of two different architectures, and we are going to see it. Uh, well, the, the renderings, they are as they are, but it was built again. Personally, I'm a little bit turned off by these round uh, columns, which are a little bit too predictable and a little bit too inflated, a little bit bombastic and a little bit commercial for my taste. But I like what he did here. Of course, it, there is glass, but at least it's uh, translucent glass. And I like uh, this play 
at the top, you know. Um, so there are small, uh, uh, small uh, interventions that um, make the building a little bit surprising, not a lot, but a little bit. And you'll see the other side, which is very different. Uh, so it is a library. Um, again, the, the importance of ornament, he treated here the you know the facade in in a clearly uh, expressed uh, ornamental way the interior uh, in the interior uh, you don't see it everywhere but uh, there are portions of the building where he was clearly uh, debating with adolf loss if indeed uh, the ornament is a crime or not Here we see from the inside the, the ornamental design on the glass that we saw it outside. And now, of course, there are architecture offices like Snoheta. They use such things and, uh, you know, other architects as well. But I'm glad that Dan Hanganu didn't reject ornament just because dogmatically modernity banished them or it. Here you see the two sides of the building. This is done in, in a certain way and here is done in a different way. And I, I, I like the fact that he tries to combine, so to speak, two systems, aesthetical systems in this case. I don't like the work system, but uh, I employed it now in the absence of a more inspired work. Unfortunately, the artwork is, uh, you know, bringing in some maybe needed uh, dynamic qualities. But the artwork was not done by him. He only did the building, if we can say only. But here, like in other uh, cases that we saw earlier or examples, what would you do here without... Uh, pumping uh, warm air or hot air in the winter. And the winter in Montreal is uh, long and probably harsh. Glass, glass and glass again, a failed project. Ah, this is something very personal. I don't know if I should tell you about this, but since uh, it is included in this, uh, <laughs> I bought this building the frontier between New York State, the United States, and Canada, one hour and a quarter, one hour and 15 minutes by car from Montreal. I bought it with $2,000 on eBay. And I liked it very much because it, it was a building between sky, earth, water on the left and, 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 and earth uh, and the road. The water belongs to the river, Salmon River, uh, Salmon being a well-known and desired, desirable fish. And the building was uh, literally uh, cantilevered over the river. So I bought it at this unbelievable price, a huge, a large building, 600 square meters. It was a small factory there, it was actually not a home. 
But when I went to visit it after I purchased it, uh, I realized it was damaged terribly by fire. And you'll understand very soon why I, I included this in the presentation about Dan Hanganu. Here is the picture of the building towards the street uh, in Malone, Malone, New York. Uh, one hour and 15 minutes, kind of like this, to Montreal, but it was in the United States, upstate New York. Uh, now I'm really nostalgic. I didn't see these images and the building doesn't belong to me any longer because uh, I didn't pay the taxes. Plus, I, you see here the building towards the river, Salmon River. I mean, beautifully lo located. So the reason I show you this building, I wanted to, uh, well, I don't think I have, no. Uh, okay. I contacted Dan Hanganu. In fact, it was in the very year when he died, some half a year before he died. And I asked him if he wouldn't be interested to, to build a building in place of this building, because this building was ravished, totally ravished by fire inside. And he told me at that time that he was um, um, ill and that he also had uh, some kind of a judicial, uh, uh, you know, a court uh, case, a ju judicial problem, but he didn't say no. I think he liked very much the, you know, the, the situation, the context here of this building. I told him the building is mine, we can build something there. And um, since he was in Montreal, he could have, uh, you know, supervised and, and so on. And I proposed to him to make a center for architecture for, uh, you know, people coming from various uh, parts of the world, including Romania, to actually donate it to the School of Architecture. Uh, because you could have uh, used the plane to go to Montreal and then in one hour and 15 minutes to arrive here. But he didn't say no, but unfortunately he died in half a year and that was it. Um, a sad uh, event and also for me a sad, uh, a sad occurrence that I, I lost this uh, building, which, which I like. I continue to like it, but I, I didn't have the means to, 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 to keep it and to work on it. Now, I, I don't know what Svan Voronianu is doing here, born and educated in Yash. This was, I think, a, an architect or a photographer. No, no. Um, well, since Dan Hangan was born in Yash, I thought of also showing this uh, LinkedIn.com uh, uh, article or, you know, entry by Razvan Voronianu, uh, this uh, rebellious looking uh, man, young man, and I like re rebellious uh, young man or not so young, uh, the builder, I think he did just the photographs. I forgot if he's, a, I think he's an architect, who also does photography. Um, and this, that's all, that's just this image by Razvan. And now we go back to some drawings by, by Dan Hangano. Again, the presentation deserves, um, deserves um, some organization. Um, I don't know why I show now these drawings by by Dan Hangan. I imagine maybe this was one of his last projects. It's possible. And unfortunately, in 2017, on October 5th, he died. So for the day of yesterday, let's wish him a happy birthday. That was it today. So let me just uh, manage to exit uh, this uh, this screen.